next speaker is uh, Scott Hindel, and he's from Nestle, but not from this location, I understood. And he's going to talk about uh, how many data we need for process capacity. Ah, I think we don't start yet. My topic is agrostat. <laughs> so, good morning. We have a little uh, actor, which isn't me. So, first of all, thank you for the opportunity. And <clears throat> to get the theme immediately into the brain, then, behind the smile of this guy, I tried yesterday and I was consistently above 15 minutes. So the question now is, am I capable now of hitting 15 minutes? So I have tried to find a, an improvement solution. Will it work? So let's hope the following points keep your attention. So <clears throat> why collect data? For computation or for action? Now, statistician's job not always easy some fundamentals to hopefully keep everybody uh, fully kind of integrated as the talk progresses. Complications of degrees of freedom, making degrees of freedom kind of understandable, and some examples hopefully to bring the key messages all together with the conclusions. So, why? So first of all, only statisticians, nobody else, collects and analyzes data for fun, nobody else. <coughs> so for the rest of the world, <coughs> the only reason to collect data is to take action. That's, let's say, the theme of the talk. So, as so well stated by this guy, formerly of Ford. So some key points. Action probably won't happen unless the data represents something important. Action may not happen if data are analyzed ineffectively. Assumption action should happen. Ineffective actions can happen with ineffective analysis. And the expected benefits of the action should be understood and communicable. Otherwise, we won't get the buy-in to take the action. Although, of course, we could say so. Maybe this is also you. Sometimes this is how I feel. So. How many data do I need? Maybe the most common question. And the statistician says it depends. <laughs> and then maybe, can you tell me a bit more about your problem? To which the person might think, oh my God, why didn't I just go for 30? I only wanted a simple answer. And then the statistician now in recovery mode trying to regain the bad start says, look, I can help you, but only if you help me. And the guy's thinking, I thought this would all be over in five minutes and it takes one hour or two hours. But hopefully it's worth it. So some fundamentals surrounding process capability. So I guess only the manufacturers that go bankrupt don't look at this question. How good is a production process? But it's rather vague, so it needs to be a bit more specific, so we could say, is fully conforming process output expected? <coughs> Non-compliance, well, hardly good for the business to grow and develop. So I propose that process capability can help, but only if the collected data form a basis for action. Without, maybe, forget it. <coughs> so back again to the how many data question. But first, how could we define capability? So we could say, uses actual data to assess if the process's output is acceptable or not, since specifications are supposed to separate acceptable from unacceptable process outcomes. Or we could say it's the relationship between the voice of the customer and the voice of the process, or more. But let's say a personal proposal would be, process capability provides a basis for action on the process if, the process characterized as predictable is not characterized as capable. We see this with a picture in a minute or two. If the process is off target, 
or if the process is unpredictable. So predictable here means statistically controlled in the traditional sense. In control, I find a terminology that does not work. And out of control is meaning unpredictable, but I find that out of control does not work because people think out of control means out of spec or worse. So the only other possibilities are good, predictable, capable, and on target. So our um, formulas, I have a book of 800 pages by this guy, so there's no shortage of capability indexes, there's many. We will focus on the two most used, CPCPK. Um, we see this in picture form in a minute, at least for the CP. But first, to make use of these statistics, we need the voice of the customer, most often stated as specifications, upper to lower spec, or lower to upper spec, and the voice of the formulas, which in the formulas would be this measure of dispersion or the measure of location, the average. But an important point, this SD within is called SD within because it's a within <laughs> subgroup dispersion statistic. In other words, it's not a global measure. A global measure would be incorrect for process capability. We see the implication for this uh, in a few minutes. So to try to visualize what this means, here is our process output. We assume it's predictable. Don't take that assumption normally, but here we do take it. So what does this mean? So the blue is, we could say, the space available for the process. And the red, coming from process data, is the space required by the process. So this is basically like having a very wide garage and a car that easily fits in the garage. You park your car with no waste or rework so that this process would be highly capable. And this statistic of 5.05, .05, in more simple terms, it basically means the space available for the process is around 500% wider than the space required by the process. So when the voice of the process is well-defined, we get something looking like this. Basically, control chart with the data, and we can say the future process output is expected to fall within these limits. That's the benefit of an in-control process because we have the connotation predictable. Now, what if the consumer says, the customer says, I want this? Our CP would be lower than one. But basically that process would not be capable because its variation is too wide. It does not fit the requirement of the process. So unless you're prepared to take a lot of losses, that's not a capable process. So very quickly, degrees of freedom. So the most common way of computing standard deviation is this. So <coughs> degrees of freedom are number of data minus one. This can help, but it's not really obvious from this slide. So how can we make it, let's say, communicable and understandable in the workplace, <coughs> knowing that our audience is not a statistical audience? So what we can do is that we can work in CV, coefficient of variation, where the CV is the, the thing here, but to get straight to the point, if we can approximate, estimate the degrees of freedom, the CV is approximately that. So we need to visualize this because that relationship as a picture means that. So, but it's highly nonlinear. So to get to the key point, the first few degrees of freedom are critical because there's high uncertainty, but diminishing returns start very early. Going from 20 to 30 degrees of freedom does not give a huge return. It does not give a great benefit. So you need to increase the degrees of freedom by four to reduce the uncertainty by half. So to try to put this in, let's say, a simple, simple way, less than 10 degrees of freedom, you probably want more. 10 to 30, it's starting to solidify, and any payback from more data is getting weaker in terms of a payback. And once you've got more than 30, well, frankly, a few more data makes no difference. Now, as mentioned, the generic standard deviation is not suitable. And what we focus on here is 
capability in the context of individual data, not subgrouping. So subgrouping would be for another day. So here is the formula. It's also called the method of successive differences. But the key thing here is not to focus on the techniques, technicalities of the method, but simply to say that that, that dispersion statistic does not have the simple <coughs> n minus one degrees of freedom. So what is it? So we can work in what's called the effective number of degrees of freedom and as shown by the guy Wheeler. It's approximately 60%, 62% of the total number of data minus one. So, for example, if you have 30 data, we have approximately 18 degrees of freedom, not 29, which is around 16, 17% of uncertainty. Sounds a lot, but if that's not good enough, you need a lot, lot, lot more data to have an impact. So now the x-axis is the number of data, no longer the degrees of freedom. So if I have um, <coughs> SD within from 30 data, I know my uncertainty. I can approximate it. If I have 10 data, it's around 30%. So highly uncertain, but maybe you can do a job with that number of data. So to this point, what's the summary? Process capability compares the voice of the process with the voice of the customer. And basically a capable process, a good process, is one where the voice of the process fits this voice of the customer. In other words, compliant output. <coughs> the voice of the process is based on a within subgroup, estimate of dispersion, hence this name within. The voice of the process is only well-defined if the process is characterized as predictable on a control chart, in older terminology, statistically controlled. And statistical theory can help us to estimate the uncertainty in this standard deviation. So we can say how solid or how weak or how soft is our standard deviation. If we want a highly solid estimate, we can use this to help approximate how many data we need. And just as a reminder, this uncertainty CV in this standard deviation is only really well defined when the process itself is characterized as predictable. If the process is changing, we have multiple standard deviations, not one. So, some examples. So here we have 13 data, not a lot. The process is in, in operation approximately once per month. The specs we see, the target is the midpoint. So after nine months, you have around 13 data values. And of course, you know that 13 values has a pretty high uncertainty associated with it. So you can look at the data like this. Here is the simple control chart for individual values. And below is a histogram where the red li lines are the red lines from this control chart, the so-called three sigma limits. Now, from that chart, we can say this chart is consistent with a predictable statistically controlled process. If we look at this, the space available for the process, the space required by the process, looks pretty good to me. So, do we have enough data? Please consider if you say no, it's taken nine months to get these data. Example two. So, we have four days, five values per day, the various specifications, you see them on the picture. So again, the, the uncertainty is pretty high. Initially, we would think, oh no, that's not a good uncertainty. So here we have the comparable picture. So <coughs> consistent with a predictable process, if it makes sense in the context of the knowledge of the operation. Now, let's look at the histogram. One non-conforming unit already identified. Clearly, we are off target. That tells us, the CP of 1.34 tells us that if we operate in the middle, we have a capability expected around 1.3, which for many people would be a satisfactory capability. So do we not have enough data to justify action on the process? What action would you take? Me, I would try to do what I did yesterday, lower the average. So I have 30 seconds to go. Maybe you give me one extra minute. So let's go to, no, that's the wrong thing. 
So I have one of 127 data, but I the previous one shows that with 127 data, you may not have enough data. But let's look at 30 data because it's such the, the common, let's say, um, way of looking at capability. So if I have these data nicely understood in sequence of production, that chart tells me it's an unpredictable process or a not in statistical control process. So for process capability to make sense, I need to want predictability. <coughs> if I don't want predictability, if I don't <coughs> have a basis to achieve predictability, process capability is just not the way I work and I am deceiving myself and all those with whom I talk. So if action is a name here, when should it have started? With 30 data or earlier? So if we look 15 data, production runs one and two only, we have a signal, a license to investigate. If we look at production runs two and three, we have more signals, a license to investigate. In other words, you have detectable changes in the process. What is the cause? Implement a control measure so that these negative effects do not reappear again. So 30 data is not a bad number. However, you learn nothing unless you look at the data. So with 30 data, we learned that the process is unpredictable, but we could have learned that earlier. So if that is waste, we could have avoided some of that waste by looking earlier, at least potentially. So key message, I guess, is that when you have data, you learn nothing if you don't look at it, even with three or four data values, maybe. So the conclusions, back to my um, cartoon character. Maybe. It's not a bad answer. We can use this graph to say that with 30 data, even with 18 degrees of freedom, not too bad. A better answer. Now imagine I say this, the guys are really confused. You only have enough data, you have enough data when any actions you plan to take are well justified. That kind of response is like, what is that guy talking about? So the answer only makes sense if the rationale behind it is understood. And part of the rationale is that action is important, but also that timely action is important and that capability is simply about action. Too many people think that capability is about the computation of the statistic, and this unfortunately is not the case. So to summarize, statistical theory helps to answer the how many data question. But alone, it's not enough. Statistical theory does not know the context of the problem. So judgment is required based on context and understanding. And so the standard answer, let's say maybe 30, it's not really the best answer because it's too one-dimensional. And so how many data will be best understood only if the problem at hand is understood, I propose. So as a comment, my process is still not capable because I am three minutes over time. Thank you. Thank you very much. And three minutes is not that bad. Okay, any questions from the audience? Yes, please. Your conclusion depends on your model. I would model this uh, sample size four, four production runs, and a within technical replicates of each five batches. If I do, though, a control chart with a mixed model, I'm sure I'm within uh, your thresholds. Mm -hmm. so you, you consider this as IID over all the time, which you can do, but it must not be. So I guess we need an hour to discuss this point maybe. But um, there's different perspectives to look at this statistical process control or process capability. I rely, let's say, on the creator's perspective, which is that it's not about a model. It's about characterization of behavior. And at the end, the chart for me is in place to help us to basically take the characterization conclusion. Do we characterize as a predictable process or as unpredictable? Meaning that if it's predictable, 
the only way to improve is to make some fundamental change. Don't look for explaining the individual points. And if it's unpredictable, then there's clues where the individual points or a few points together may have an assignable cause. So I know we can model it, but also for the environment in which I have to interact. Again, question of perspective. I am not convinced that would make it easier to get this accepted where it needs to be implemented. <laughs>